short delay, we're reading out of 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. It says, The grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us. The Holy Spirit is the least known of all. We talk about God the Father and how in the beginning, you know, and, and then we talk about his, his Son, Jesus. But we talk about the Holy Spirit and we call Him it and we call Him all these various things. But let me tell you, He is a person. He is the third person of the Trinity. He is God here on this earth. Now Jesus said in John 14, verse 16, He says, I am praying to the Father and He will send you a comforter, a counselor, an advocate, someone to be in you and within you and around you all the time, to be with you so that you and I would never sense that we are ever alone. If we go to 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19, he says, Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we have been bought with a price, and that price was the blood of Jesus. That brother that came by there a while ago, and he says, What is the evidence of what is going on? The evidence is the empty tomb, because the, when Jesus came out of that tomb, he went to be with the Father, and he seated at right hand of majesty on high. God the Father is in heaven, the third heaven that we read about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul says, I don't know if I had visions or I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body, but I had revelations in 2 Corinthians 12. So we know that the things of God are being brought forth to feed our person. And, and so God said I am through Jesus, His Son, I am going to pray the Father and He's going to send the Holy Spirit. Well, when Jesus came out of the tomb on the day of Pentecost, which was 40 days after Jesus was resurrected, the Spirit was given. Remember what Jesus said in Acts chapter 4 and in John 20, 21. He breathed on them and he says, Receive the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 1, 4 through 8, he says, And not many days hence, go and wait, and the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost, which is the seal of our redemption from the sins that we have been in and committed the iniquities. If you go to Ezekiel 36, verse 26, 7, and 8, you're going to find that through the prophet Ezekiel that the Lord prophesied that the Spirit of God would be poured out upon all flesh and that God would take our stony hearts out and put a heart of flesh within us. And He's not talking about a blood pump. He's talking about our real person and that He would write His laws and His, His ways and His commandments upon our spirit. And that was fulfilled in, in Hebrews, the, the ninth chapter, where it says, How much more will the blood of Christ, through the ever eternal Spirit, bring forth and set mankind free from their sins? So when you begin to realize that this was God's plan. Now you think about well, why in Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2, where in, in the upper room there was 120. If you go back to 1 Corinthians 15, you're going to find that Jesus appeared between the day of the resurrection and the day of the Pentecost on Passover, that God appeared to over 554 people. Paul was the last one that he appeared to. Amazingly, there was 120. Now there's a reason for the 120. Maybe this will help you some. The 120 was the same amount that was given in the days when in Second Chronicles when Solomon had the temple, and he had 120 priests that blew the shofar, the trumpets. Remember that? So there was 120. And then the temple was filled with the glory of the Lord. Okay? And none could stand. Also, the 120 was the days that Noah began to build the ark, and it took him to complete the ark. It also ended the days of the flesh, because the Lord Father said that the days of the flesh is ended here at the end when the world was destroyed. Another reason that it was there is because it's the length of the time of the days of man here on this earth, 120 years. It speaks of that in, in that when it talks about in Genesis. So you begin to realize that all these things, they're not secret and they're not hard to understand that God has a plan and He's called revealing the Holy Spirit. Now most of us have been raised up in denominations and most of us have been raised to, to the traditions of men. And so because the Holy Spirit is like a free person, he, he is a perfect gentleman. And He will not hinder you. He will not do a thing in you until you come to a place where you're willing to say, Holy Spirit, take me and use me for the Father's glory that the Son may be lifted up, that all men would be drawn. Now we, it says over and over in the Bible, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Now what happens to us is we do that. 
You say, how do we do that? Well, first of all, if, you, if Jesus is our example, we must do what Jesus did then. Because Jesus in John 5, 19, he says, I only do and say what I see my Father saying and doing. So if Jesus only does and says what the Father says, well, how are we going to know what to do? So we have to be led by the Spirit of God. What does it say in John 4, uh, 4, uh, John, excuse me, Romans chapter 8, verse 14 through 16? It says, all that are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So when we be born again, we're baptized with water into the body, and then we're filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which a lot of churches don't teach, and, he, and some that do, and then they try to put a quietness to it, or put a quietness to it, or a controlling factor in it, and they do not allow that. Now, if you want to check this out, go read 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. It says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we look with an unveiled face into the glory of the Lord daily. So what happens to us, if Jesus is our example, Jesus went down to the river Jordan, and he was baptized by John in the water for, for the repentance of sins. Now we know that Jesus was kept sinless by the Holy Spirit. It finally dawned on me how he could be sinless. The Holy Spirit kept him from sinning. The Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us and keep us from sinning if we would walk in his glory. If we would constantly be in conversation. He's talking about having communion here with the Holy Spirit. He's talking about having a conversation with the Holy Spirit. He's talking about when you come up to somebody, Lord, do you want me to witness to them? Do you want me to pray for that person that's crippled? Do you want me to lay hands on that person that has blind eye? What, did you, what would you have me to do, Holy Spirit? Or where would you have me to eat today or buy fuel today? Or what would you have me to do today? You have to have a communion and a relationship with someone. And the Holy Spirit is someone. He is the third part of the Trinity. When Jesus came up out of that water, when, when John the Baptist baptized him, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove, very gently, very quietly. And then he was led, one place he was led in the Gospels, one place he was driven into the desert, it says by the Holy Spirit. But we know once he was out there, Satan came and tried to tempt Jesus. Now Jesus was sinless, lived a sinless life for me and you. That is the evidence. The empty tomb is an evidence. The empty cross is the evidence. What is the evidence that Jesus is the Son of God? He came to seek and to save to that which was lost and to doctor those that are sick and afflicted. So when the Spirit of God descended upon him, he left the enemy in the desert defeated by the Word of God. Thou shalt live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Okay, and then he says, Thou shalt not test the Lord thy God. So we know that Jesus is our example. All right, now when he came back, it was prophesied that he would come back by the way of the Galilee through Naphtali. And Nazareth. So when he came back, he came up back under the power of the Spirit. And when people came to him, he says, Is this not the carpenter's son? Is this not Jesus that was down there in Nazareth? That his father was Joseph? And so they had a hard time believing and receiving who Jesus was and is. Now the revealing of the Spirit is that you and I need to come to a place. Now let's talk about the various parts of this verse. The first one is the grace of the Lord Jesus. The grace is God's unmerited favor towards all people. God loves all people. In John 3, 16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him would have eternal life or God's life in him. Now, there is a method in what that scripture says. The method is the grace of Jesus, the unmerited favor, through the shedding of his blood, through the willfully being going to that cross, through the Spirit, the eternal Spirit, Jesus was able to lay his life down. He was able to lick it, lift his life back up. Through the eternal Spirit. By himself, it's just like he says, when Jesus was weak, he became strong by the Spirit. What does it say? In Zechariah 4, 6, it says, It's not by power or might, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Jesus understood the power of the Spirit because he was Spirit. God the Father is Spirit. We are Spirit. So when we understand this, then we understand what the Spirit is doing within us. Now the Spirit is in us, around us, and encompasses us. But He will not overpower you. He will not put you under. He will allow you to ask questions. He will allow you to ask questions and hear His, His voice within you. And sometimes it will scare the pants off of you because literally you hear a voice and you say, Where did that come from? And He will tell you, don't go there, go there. 
or don't do this, do this. And we must be obedient. We must learn to hear His voice. We must learn to have communion or fellowship with Him. Now you're not talking to somebody that doesn't exist. You're not a looney tune. Now, all the gifts of the Spirit, including every believer, ought to pray in an unknown language or a godly language. That is part of it. Read Mark 16. These signs shall follow them that believe. They will speak in new tongues. They will cast out demons. If a snake bites them, it won't hurt them. If they drink deadly poison, it won't hurt them. And these signs and wonders will follow them that believe and speak God's word. So you begin to believe. You begin to receive. You begin to act like Jesus. You begin to do all these things. He says, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Well, who is the truth? Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So we know that the truth is, is Jesus. Well, the Holy Spirit brings this all to reality. Now, the gifts of the Spirit belong to the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, they belong to Him. The word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, the word of miracles, the gifts of healing, the gift of discernment, the power of, of, the, of the heavenly language within the body of speaking with a new tongue, the interpretation of that, we understand that. Then in the fruit of the Spirit, we have love, joy, gentleness, peace, patience, kindness, long-suffering. You do not have to memorize the Word of God. Get the Holy Ghost and He knows the Word of God. Get Jesus and He knows the Word of God. Get the Father and He wrote the book by the inspiration of His Spirit. Get Jesus. Get the Father. Now, you know, as Christians, we misunderstand some things. The next part of this verse here, it says, talks about the love of God. Well, if you read Romans chapter 5, verse 5, it says, The love of God was shed abroad in our hearts. How? By the Holy Spirit. You shall know the brethren because of the love of the brethren. We know people by the fruit of their activities, the fruit of their life, the activities that they're doing, the words of their mouth. You can tell who's praying for the leadership of this world and this nation by the conversation that comes out of it. We're all dis disgusted to no end, but we must learn to pray. We must learn to walk and listen to the Spirit of God. He has a plan. If you go back all through the, the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation, there would be times that the Spirit of God would come upon a person. Usually it was the prophet, the priest, or the king. And when it did, great and mighty things happened. We saw Samson, who went out with the jawbone of an ass, killed a thousand Philistines one day under the power of the Holy Spirit. We know that when Peter and John prayed for the guy at the, at the gate, beautiful, and the, the man was, came up there, and we know that he says, Silver or gold have I none, but what I do have in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. We know that when Peter walked down the street, that his shadow would fall upon the people and they would be healed. We know that Paul was down there and some sorcerers came up there and he says, you'll be blind for a season. We know that Peter talked to one like that. We know that Jesus raised people from the dead. We know that Peter raised a person from the dead. We know that Paul raised people from the dead. We know that the Spirit of God was upon these men and it's upon us. It's the revealing. The next part of it is the communion or the fellowshipping with the Spirit. Now because he is silent most of the time, and we have quenched him a lot of times. He is ever present. He never really leaves us because God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, but I have brought you to a place where you must understand that you have to walk with me. In Amos 3.3 3, it says, How can we walk together? How can two walk together unless we agree? So when you begin to understand, what is he saying to you as an individual? Everything, you know, in Romans it talks about an interesting verse. It says, Find someone that has a kindred spirit. Well, what is the kindred spirit? A like person, a like spirit in them. Inside of us is one spirit, the Holy Spirit. If there's anything else coming out of us, it is not a kindred spirit. It is not one of God. If you're addicted to alcohol or lust or, or whatever, to any sin, that sin will draw you away from the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is convicting me and you all the time and showing us that we need to repent, turn from, and He's showing us how to be filled and motivated. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. 